in the Exodus workbook, I created a, uh, a little chart in the introduction on page uh, Roman numeral 9, uh, and it shows the, uh, the parallels uh, of the plagues in the book of Exodus, and uh, they're equal parallel to uh, in, in the book of Revelation. And, you know, with the exception of gnats and flies, they're virtually identical. Uh, now, where Revelation lacks gnats and flies, Exodus lacks, you know, mountains falling out of the sky and <laughs> massive earthquakes and stuff like that. But but for the most part, uh, the, parale the, the parallels are uncanny. I mean, it's it's really quite amazing when you look at it. Something else really interesting as a result of looking at last week's study. Uh, last week was where we went through Exodus uh, chapter 1 through 6. This is the, sort of the beginning of, of the, the book. Um, but it talks about a, a pharaoh that arose that did not remember Joseph, right? Uh, it says, I'm going to read something that my friend Kevin wrote. Uh, and he picked up on the works of uh, Dr. Chuck Missler. Uh, to reveal something quite extraordinary, I think, especially when you take into consideration the idea that Revelation could be an exact repeat or amped up repeat of the book of Exodus. Now, if you've been listening to my broadcast, read any of my books, watching my DVDs or videos on YouTube or whatever, read my blogs, you know who I think the Antichrist is. I firmly believe that the Antichrist is the Assyrian of Micah chapter 5, is the body that was pulled out of the desert in Matthew 24 and loaded into the secret chambers in Matthew 24, and it is going to come up out of the bottomless pit in Revelation 9, who had a mortal head wound in Revelation 13, and who is the eighth who is of the seven of Revelation 17. That, of course, would be Nimrod, who I believe is the only individual in all of world history that fits every single description of the Antichrist that we can imagine, who is the beast, who is Apollo or, a.k.a. Apollyon, a.k.a. Abaddon of Revelation chapter 9, who tells you who the Antichrist beast is by name, who comes up out of the bottomless pit. Revelation 17 clearly tells us the beast comes from the bottomless pit. He doesn't come from Kenya. He doesn't come from Hawaii, the European Union, the Vatican, or any other place you've heard eschatolo eschatology teachers telling you. Um, you know, look, I'm, I'm no scholar. I have no letters after my name, but I can read. And I can even read the King's English, King James. <laughs> and King Jimmy and all the other English translations of Revelation 17 tell me that the beast comes from the bottomless pit. And then it tells me when the beast comes from the bottomless pit, and that's in Revelation chapter 9 at the fifth trumpet. So being that I firmly believe that the Antichrist is the Assyrian, who is Nimrod, who is the beast, who is Apollo, uh, consider this. And i, I got to give credit where credit is due. My friend Kevin Roberts had wrote this little page-and-a-half document uh, based on something he had read from Chuck Missler. Uh, check this out. In Exodus 1, we see that now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Now, we'll recall from Genesis that Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's terrible dreams of the famine to come. Joseph developed and implemented a plan to save the entire world from the effects of the famine while consolidating nearly all the land of Egypt and vast wealth from neighboring nations and ultimately was promoted to prime minister of Egypt. Most political leaders are well educated in their own national history and usually world history as well. So it is very hard to imagine any ethnic Egyptian would go through a life of education and preparation to be king over Egypt and have never heard of Joseph, who had served so faithfully and was well-received by the people in relatively recent history. Is it possible that this, quote-unquote, new king who arose over Egypt was actually of some other ethnicity? Consider this, Acts chapter 7, verses 17 through 19 says, But when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose who did not know Joseph. This man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they might not live. In English, we have one word for the concept of another, but in Greek, there are two words, allos and heteros. The one used in this passage is heteros, like where we get heterosexual from. Now, heteros, Strong's 
2087, meaning one not of the same nature, form, class, or kind, different or strange. Whereas the Greek word allos is Strong's 243. It's used for one other and additional instance of similar kind. Okay, see the difference? Allos, the Greek word allos is, is another one, but of a similar kind, whereas heteros is another, but of a different kind. Well, consider the context of the two additional references from Acts where heteros is used. Heteros is used in, the, in Acts 7, 17 through 19, where Stephen's giving uh, the replay of the book of Exodus, talking about another king, another being heteros, another of a different kind. Uh, we have other references, like in Acts 17, 5 through 7. But the Jews were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil from the marketplace, and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the whole world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. In that case, the word another is heteros, a different kind of king. The writer of Acts chose heteros to differentiate between Yeshua and Caesar. These men could not be more dissimilar, uh, obviously. Uh, consider also Acts chapter 1, verses 16 through 20. Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus, for he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem, so that field is called in their own language, Ekel Dama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate, and let no one live in it, and let another take his office. The disciples were looking to replace the betrayer, Judas Iscariot, with one completely unlike him. So we have two witnesses showing us that heteros, uh, a heteros king arose over Egypt. In other words, one who was completely unlike the other pharaohs before him. Consider the following. Isaiah 52, verse 4. Thus says the Lord God, My people went down at first into Egypt to dwell there. Then the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Huh. Is it possible that the pharaoh of Egypt during the Exodus was an ethnic Assyrian who somehow, perhaps through military invasion, usurped the Egyptian political structure. Might these Assyrians have been uneasy occupiers of their colony who lived amongst the discontented ethnic Egyptian majority population? Did they have escalating concerns over the large and growing minority Israel population within the country who, through God's blessing of high birth rate and physical labor, that gave them strength, were, quote, more and mightier, end quote, than them. The possible invading and occupying military forces on assignment in Egypt. How likely is it that the two to four million Israelites outnumbered the entire population of ethnic Egyptians who made up the most prominent kingdom over all the earth at the time? Note, many of these Egyptians fled across the Red Sea along with the Israelites. It is conceivable that the pharaoh of Egypt during the time of the Exodus was an ethnic Assyrian, as noted by Isaiah. This possibility has significant implications for end-time prophecies concerning the quote-unquote pharaoh of Egypt. I found that just absolutely extraordinary. And I will certainly, it's the first I've ever heard of that, but it's first, uh, my friend Kevin stumbled upon that and shared it with us uh, at our weekend study um, yesterday. And uh, again, he got that from Chuck Missler, something that Chuck had written. Uh, and anybody, he, I haven't read the the article that Chuck wrote. Uh, I don't know if this article that Kevin wrote is just a copy and paste of Chuck's or if this is Kevin's words. I, don't, I haven't checked it out yet. But he said that he, he was looking at something that Chuck Missler had written and that he had made sort of a passing observation, almost like a drive-by. You know, hey, oh, well, by the way, check this out. <laughs> uh, but I, I think it's more than a passive or passing observation. Uh, uh, observation. I think it's something we really need to be ta paying attention to, especially if the theory is true 
that the Assyrian of Micah 5 from the land of Nimrod is in fact Nimrod, the beast that rises up out of the bottomless pit in Revelation chapter 9 at the fifth trumpet and going into the last days because we could be seriously looking at a play-by-play roadmap for understanding the tribulation period by reading the Torah. Well, go figure. I mean, the Torah was dictated to Moses. It says that Moses spoke with God face-to-face as one speaks with a friend. Okay? I mean, not to cast any uh, bad light on the inspired scriptures, but, you know, I think there's a little bit of a difference between Holy Spirit-inspired scriptures written by men and scriptures written by an individual who sat in front of God face to face and face and had God dictate to him how the creation occurred and how everything else. You know, Moses was up on the mountain, you know, for quite a while. You know, um, a lot longer than it would take to to read or write Ten Commandments. <laughs> I, I believe he got a, a serious tutorial on the, the way everything works from start to finish, from creation to uh, the end of the millennial reign, uh, laid out for us in the five books of Moses. And I find it interesting also that, uh, and I'm going to pull something up here if my computer will cooperate with me, uh, in the end of, uh, actually, I'll just do it the old-fashioned way, grab my my Bible and open it up to pages. (laughs) What a concept. To the, the last book of what we call the Old Testament, that being, of course, Malachi. It says in Malachi... Chapter 4, and everybody talks about verse five, uh, yeah, verse 5, that Elijah must come before the great and terrible day of the Lord. But let's go back a few verses before that. <laughs> uh, verse 1, and I'll read from the uh, King James here. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name, okay, so he's talking about there's going to be people in the last days that that fear or reverence, honor the name, which is not the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, nor is it God. It His name is, I pronounce it Yahuwah, some pronounce it Jehovah or Jehovah or Yahweh. Uh, Regardless, everybody's doing the best they can with uh, vowels and uh, that are not really there <laughs> for yod heh vav the consonants yod heh vav um, Now, uh, there are some ancient uh, Hebrew writings that, that did insert vowels, and um, Nehemiah Gordon, for one thing, uh, points some of those out, and uh, that's uh, some of the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures that were used for the translation of the King James Bible, which is why the King James rendered it Jehovah, based on the uh, vowel markings. Now, of course, that, that came through, I believe, German and Latin, and before it finally made its way to English, there's no J in the Hebrew, so it would have been Yahowa. There's not a V sound either, so the, the Vav would be more of a Wa. Uh, so it would have been Yahowa or Yehovah or Jehovah, um, according to those vowel markings. There's a reason to believe that there are other vowel markings that would have uh, lent itself to the interpretation of Yahuwah, that's the one I'm currently convinced of, but I don't think Yahweh is wrong either. So, again, I, I'm not a sacred name guy, so I don't get wrapped around the axle like some people do about this stuff. It's yod heh But we see in Malachi chapter 4 that in the last days, the last days context, there will be people who fear or reverence or highly acknowledge, uh, let's say, honor the name of God, and they shall sh- uh, they. Uh, let's see, let's go back. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Verse 4. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant. Now this is talking in a last day's prophetic context about the day of the Lord, end time stuff. It's saying, to, in a in last days, end times context, remember the law of Moses. Don't forget it. Don't think it was nailed to the cross and we don't have to deal with it anymore except for cool Sunday school lessons, stories. No. We, we are supposed to be paying attention to it. Why? It's the roadmap. I'm telling you, after this is my fourth year looking into it, I, I'm more convinced now than ever 
that it, and some people say, well, why do we need to know this? Because they believe they're in a pre-trip rapture. Um, well, I, I used to believe that myself. Uh, I'll have to confess that for about 40 years of my life, uh, I was a pretty hardcore um, pre-tripper. You know, I, and of course, I, I'm only 44, so I grew up in a Christian family that was pre-trip. So from the time I was born, I was in church, and in the churches that I was in, everybody was preaching pre-trip. Believed it myself as soon as I had the cognitive abil- abilities to understand uh, what was being said. I believe in the preacher rapture myself. But in the last three years or so, uh, doing my own study of Scripture, uh, as opposed to just believing what everybody was telling me, I don't believe in the preacher rapture anymore. I definitely don't believe it. <laughs> uh, I moved to mid-trib for a while, hung out in the pre-trib, in the mid-trib uh, view for a while, thought I was cool there, but mm, still couldn't get around Matthew 24, 29 through 30. Uh, where Jesus clearly says the only time that he's going to be in the clouds, unless you subscribe to eisegesis, which is where you insert your own ideas into the text that don't exist, um, uh, I believe ec- proper exegesis, so it's proper study of the scripture, reveals that the only time Jesus is going to be in the clouds is after the tribulation of those days. And that's where Paul says, when the harpazo takes place, that we're going to meet him in the clouds. Well, the scripture only tells me one time he's going to be in the clouds, and he says clear as day in fifth grade reading level English, it's after the tribulation period. And uh, when I finally brought myself to accept that, uh, I saw that the scriptures were talking about that all over the place. I mean, the one view that I absolutely could not wrap my head around, that being the post-trib view, was the one I actually eventually found the most support for in the scriptures. So that being the case, realizing, well, um, we might actually go through this thing. Um, now, I don't believe we're going to experience the bowls, that the wrath of God is in the bowl judgments, which I, which I actually believe are poured out in one day, one little 24-hour time period at the end of the seven-year tribulation period or the great tribulation period. Uh, I believe it's poured out the very last day, uh, which will be the beginning of the great day of the Lord. In God's terms, a day is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day, the day of the Lord being the Sabbath, thousand year uh, time period since the time of Adam being the millennial reign of Christ uh, I believe that the wrath is poured out at the last physical 24 hour day that kicks off the beginning of the God day or the millennial reign of Christ thousand years so uh, for those who are believers and who are not appointed to wrath and who are obedient I don't think uh, it's a broad stroke statement I think uh, there's a reason why Yeshua and Paul and others repeatedly said, be not deceived, let no man deceive you. I believe they warned us because it's possible to be deceived. And if you decide to stick around and hang out in Babylon, when the call of the last days is to come out of Babylon, then unfortunately you're going to partake of her plagues. That's what the call is. Come out of her, my people. Why? So that you do not partake of her plagues. But if you disobey and you say, no, I like Christmas, I like Easter, I like everything that does has to do with Babylon. Babylon is cool. I, I, you know, I think I want to stay here. Well, uh, I believe Scripture is telling that's your decision. You're going to experience the plagues. You will experience the wrath. It's not appointed to you, just like it was not appointed to the Israelites for their firstborn children to die. It was not appointed for them to lose their firstborn kid. But if they didn't put the blood on the door, well, guess what? They lost their firstborn kid. So while they were not appointed to that, if they were disobedient, they received it anyway. And so so also, I believe, is the case in the last days. Yes, we are not appointed to the wrath that's going to be poured out on Nimrod, Babylon, and the whole beast system. But if you choose to stay in the beast system, well, you had your warning. <laughs> it's not appointed to you, but you're going to go through it. And that's why I'm so passionate. People are like, Rob, why did you go so crazy over Christmas? Because it's Babylon. Guys, it's Babylon. It's serious. It doesn't get much more serious than that. If we believe, you know, let's not just give lip service to this whole thing that we think it's the last days. If we really, truly believe that, then men, now more than ever, we need to get right with God and get on his page and do things his way. As Jim Staley says, Bible things in Bible ways. I believe that's true. We need to be doing Bible things in Bible ways, not our own ways. Well, that's just the way, it, what it means to me. No, who cares what it means to you? It's what it means to God. That's what's important. You know, we, we're in this 
Gregorian New Year, but you know what? That's not the time the New Year begins. New Year, well, we'll read that next week's study, uh, begins in the month of Passover, according to the Bible. So what if we as Christians may need to be paying attention to God's calendar? Do you think maybe there's a reason why he put it in there for us? that it's important for us, that he said it's so important that in the last day's context, he tells Malachi to write, remember the law of Moses? Why? Because the roadmap is there, and the roadmap deals with appointed times, Moedim, the feast of Yahuwah, the feast of yod heh vav They are not the feast of the Jews. I don't know how many times I had to say that this last few weeks dealing with people in the, on Facebook. They, oh, I, I don't want to do a feast of the Jews. That's for the Jews. And look, look, it's not the read. Open your Bible, people. Forget what Rob Skiba says. He's crazy. He, you know, he's a nutcase. Forget him. Go read your Bible. I'll put it up to Leviticus 23. Read it. It says, these are the feasts of yod heh vav heh These are the feasts of Yahuwah. These are the feasts of God. They're his feasts. They're his appointed times, Moedim. Why are they appointed times? Because those are the times that he's appointed to do things on. And he did it right from the beginning. I believe Adam was created on Yom Teruah, Feast of Trumpets. And from that point forward, every major event, or if not every, pretty close to every, uh, and I'm learning more and more how many uh, events took place in our Bible, even prior to the book of Exodus story, uh, to the law being given on Mount Sinai. Major events, flood, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah, lots of these things, um, as I understand it, and I'm still searching these things out myself, landed on the same time period that would later be called the Moedim. They were appointed times. Clockwork. That's the schedule that God's on. And Yeshua is the main actor, so to speak, uh, speak on this... Uh, stage of life that God has laid out for us, this this divine drama, if you will. He's the main character. He knows his lines perfectly, and he hits his mark every time, and he hits them on the appointed times. So any knucklehead that's out there saying the rapture is going to happen next month or whenever, look, if it's not during a Moedim, forget it. Write the guy off as a nutcase, because he's not even remotely close. The shoe is coming back on the Feast of Trumpets. Uh, best I can tell from my research. Again, don't believe me. Go search it out for yourself and see if these things be true. But I believe the scriptures are indicating that he fulfilled the uh, spring feast perfectly, died on Passover, buried on unleavened bread, uh, rose on first fruits. First fruits. Man, I'm having trouble with my tongue tonight. Um, Holy Spirit came down on Pentecost. Uh, I actually believe he was born on the Feast of Trumpets, so in a way he... He fulfilled that. Um, some say tabernacles. I, I disagree based on Revelation chapter 12 because Re- Revelation 12 gives us a stellar alignment that uh, heralds his birth. And Genesis uh, 1, I think, is verse 14, talks about the sun, moon, and stars being there for signs and for seasons. They're there to, to be signs for us. And the only time that that sign happened uh, in history uh, that would be even remotely close to the time period when Yeshua showed up was September 11th, 3 B.C. Uh, I believe it was strategic why the devil chose that day to, to unleash hell on, in this country and create this uh, war on terror, which I believe is the second horse of the apocalypse, in my opinion. War has been declared on a, a fictional idea conjured up in Luciferians' minds. It's not a war against a people group or a nation. It's a war against an idea. An idea conjured up in Luciferians' minds that has effectively stripped peace from the earth forever. There'll never be peace. because it's, you, How do you wage war? It's not a war against a people or a nation. It's a war against an idea. And as long as the Luciferians are in charge, and I don't see any end to that in the near future until the millennial reign, um, that's a never-ending war. So in my opinion, the second horse is written. Uh, the war on terror is, is, in my opinion, a fulfillment of that. So, anyway, I'm rambling. I don't, I don't even know where I'm going with all that, but just to say, guys, I, I I personally believe we have less than 20 years. Some think it's, you know, it's even closer than that. So if that's the case, and if it's true that we're going through this tribulation, don't you think it's a good idea to have an idea what what we're about to go through and how to survive it? Yeah, I believe that, it, 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 you know, it's critically important for us to do that. And if Yeshua is coming back on his birthday, 
which is not December 25th. It's, it's Feast of Trumpets. It's coming back on his birthday, which also Feast of Trumpets is the time the kings are coronated, uh, coronated. And we know that first time around, he came as a suffering servant, as the Lamb of God. He didn't come as the conquering king. You know, we even say it. He's our soon coming king. Well, kings are coronated on the Feast of Trumpets. He's coming back to set up his millennial reign on the Feast of Trumpets <laughs> on his birthday. You know, and there's going to be a time of judgment, Day of Atonement, and we're going to tabernacle with him for a thousand years. Okay, Feast of Tabernacles. And Zechariah 14 clearly indicates that we're going to still be doing it. The apostles did it. Everybody's doing the feasts. You know, uh, whoever got this idea that it ended with, uh, you know, the writings of Paul, uh, you know, says that all this stuff was nailed on the cross, we don't need to do it anymore. Well, uh, I'm sorry, but words like forever and everlasting, uh, you know, call me crazy, but I think that they mean, I think words mean things. Eternal, everlasting, forever. (laughs) And we're going to see when he gets into setting up the Passover next week, and next week's study, um, week 15, he says everlasting. This is forever. This is an ordinance that you need to observe forever, which says uh, right from the beginning that Passover was meant to be remembered. And it says repeatedly that when your children ask you, why are we doing this? It's to remember what we're going to read about concerning the Exodus. That was the purpose of it. The purpose of Passover was to always remember something. And when Yeshua had his Passover meal that he said that he so longed to have with his disciples, what did he say? Do this. Do what? Lord's Supper? Communion? No, that's Catholic. This, in that context, was the Passover meal. He says, when you do this, what? Passover meal, do it from this point on in remembrance of me. Passover was always to be done as a ritual of remembrance, right from day one, uh, when God gave it. So, you know, that's why we do it. He's going to be landing on the, uh, everything he's going to do is going to be on the appointed times of Moedim, that we are to, what in Hebrew, mikra, which means rehearse. Uh, I come from a theater background, a, a television and movie background. You rehearse. Why? So you get it right. <laughs> When the curtain opens and the, it's showtime, you hopefully have done enough rehearsals so you know your lines and you end up being, you hit your marks so you're in the right place at the right time doing everything according to the script. Well, God gave us a script. It's called the Bible. He gave us a roadmap in the Torah. He gave us feasts to observe as appointed times that he's going to do stuff on. So if we rehearse them, and, and part of the reason for rehearsal is to get it right. And, you know, I think a lot of us, are still trying to figure this out, and we don't have it all right yet. Uh, and I believe as we continue to rehearse, God's going to, as a, if I can use the phrase, a director <laughs> of this divine cosmic chess match, as L.A. Marzulli would say, or this divine drama, he's going to lovingly direct us and correct us. Uh, I'm sorry, you're, you're missing the mark here. Uh, go a little more to the left. Go a little more to the right. Uh, this is really what this line means. You know, as a director myself, that's what I do with my actors. If they're not hitting their mark properly, I guide them to the place that they need to be. If they're not getting their lines right, I coach them to get it right. Okay? That's what I do as a director. I believe that that's what God is doing to his people who are rehearsing as best they can. Now, having said that, uh, a lot of people have asked about the, the feast and when are they and all that stuff and have been wondering about a calendar. Well, uh, Amanda, uh, Kevin's wife, uh, have finally finished the uh, the calendar. They got it. It's in print. Uh, we're still trying to figure out the best deal for um, being able to get them to sell them in print. Uh, unfortunately, they're pretty expensive to, to get printed. Um, but we have provided it for you uh, in PDF format on our website for free. So if you go again to virtualhousechurch.com and in the uh, left-hand column there, you'll see, if you scroll down, to, you'll see a, a colorful calendar, Understanding Yahuwah's Appointed Times. And uh, you can click on that uh, that little banner right there and it'll open up a PDF for you. Or you could go to uh, week number 14, Exodus week 14, and click on the uh, 
the link for this week's study, and you'll see a bigger picture of it right there. You can click on it, and it takes it to the same place. So you can download that. You can print it yourself off your computer or, you know, just look at it as a PDF or whatever. But um, now we put it up here with the caveat that we are not 100% convinced that we have it all right either. Based on our research, we believe that this is true. We believe that it is accurate. Um, but test it, as they say at 119 Ministries, test all things. So we encourage you to test it. Now, I will say this. There, there are some that will find issue with it because they believe that the new moon is the conjunction moon, uh, which is not visible. There are others who believe that the new moon is the crescent moon. And there are others that say we shouldn't be paying to any attention to the moon whatsoever. They think, you know, what are you guys doing looking at the moon for? So, you know, rather than calling everybody a heretic and, you know, not fellowshipping with people, I'm not like that. And and neither are the people in our group. We are more about, look, we just want to know what the truth is. If I'm wrong, great. Just tell me the truth. And I'll correct it, you know. Uh at the moment, we think we're right. <laughs> so we've produced a, a calendar based on what we think is right. But again, I'm just putting it forward with that caveat that we are not 100% sure that we have it right. And so we encourage you to test it. In, in the meantime, you can check it out. And um, that's the schedule we'll, we will be following in terms of uh, celebration of the feast and um the Torah portions and stuff like that. So uh, Rosh Kodesh and all that good stuff. Um, but uh big thank you to Kevin Amanda. He put a lot of work into this. Uh, and I think if you check it, if you open that up, you'll see that, you know, a lot of work went into it. And there's explanations at the beginning of the calendar as well as at the end of the calendar for why we think the way we think, why we believe what we believe, and why we put the calendar together the way that, or I should say they did. I didn't do anything. I, I posted the picture. So, um, uh, you know, they, what they did and why I believe it's true, put it that way. Okay? So that was a big, long, drawn-out, babbling introduction here, but I just want to uh, elaborate a little bit more on my thoughts regarding the tribulation period and us as believers going through it. If If it is an exact repeat, an amped-up repeat, I should say. Uh, we see that the Israelites experienced three of the ten plagues. Uh, they had to go through some stuff. But you know, around about the fourth plague or so, uh, they were preserved in an earth-bound place of safety called Goshen. And uh, we see that in a few places here uh, in the portion we just read. And Exodus chapter 8, verse 22 and I will sever in that day the land of Goshen in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there. To the end, thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. So he, he set a place apart for them that would be safe, that they wouldn't have to experience the rest of the stuff. Uh, yeah, that's the fourth plague at the, at the fly. So they went through the blood water, the frogs, and the gnats. But by the time we get to the flies, they were, uh, they were preserved. So could it be that we're going to go through a bunch of stuff too, but that rather than a rapture, we will find ourselves in an earthbound place of safety, similar to a Goshen. Uh, some might even suggest actual Goshen itself. Uh, there might be good reason to believe we may find ourselves in what could be determined to be a greater exodus and uh, assembled in the desert or the wilderness of North Africa ourselves. Um, along those lines, consider Jeremiah 23, uh, beginning in verse 1, going through verse 8. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel concerning the shepherds who are tending my people, you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not attended to them. Behold, I am about to attend to you for the evil of your deeds, declares the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their pasture, and they will be fruitful and multiply. Notice he didn't say the Rothschilds, the Zionists, uh, the uh, United Nations or United States or Freemasons. He said, I myself will do this. I'm going to gather them. I will also raise up shepherds over them, and they will tend them, and they will not be afraid any longer, nor be terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. 
Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell safely or securely. And this is his name by which he will be called, the Lord our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when they will no longer say, as the Lord lives who brought up the sons of Israel from the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives who brought up and led back the descendants of the household of Israel from the north land and from all the countries where I had driven them, then they will live on their own soil. That's the, the big true ingathering of Israel that everybody's looking for. Um, I believe the one in 1948 is Zephaniah chapter 2, where oh, I read Zephaniah 1 and, and Zephaniah 2. Uh, I believe that fits 1948. None of the scriptures that we can look at for the last days, Exodus, uh, fits 1948. None of them. Uh, and Jeremiah 23 being one such scripture. That This is where some people will refer to as a greater Exodus because it says, you know, no longer are the people going to remember the Exodus that took place in the time of Moses. Because this one's going to be so much greater when God himself does it. I mean, it's going to be miraculous. I don't know how it's going to happen, but somehow he's going to gather everybody uh, together in one place. And, you know, maybe it will be Goshen. Maybe it'll be a Goshen-like experience. I don't know. Uh, but it's not a rapture. It's not leaving the earth. And I'll read something that I wrote uh, a couple of years ago. Many try to point to Old Testament scriptures for proof of rapture-like scenarios. But most of those examples actually better support this thesis of an exodus to a Goshen-like place of safety for those who are obedient and ready rather than support for any pre-trib rapture view. Um, one of the other names for Yom Teruah, for that particular particular feast, is Yom Hakaseh, the day of hiding. Day of hiding. There really are only two examples of a true rapture in the Old Testament, and those are, of course, Enoch and Elijah's supernatural removal from the planet. All other examples reference some form of an exodus to a place of safety on the earth. For instance, the story of Noah's Ark shows God's people in a place of safety, both before the flood and during it. In both cases, they remained here on earth. Noah and his ark were not raptured. Another example often uh, given, involves the story of Lot, his family, and Sodom and Gomorrah. Even before the destruction of those cities, we see a foreshadow of the same principle at work. When the people of Sodom wanted to impose themselves onto Lot and his angelic visitors, the angels protected Lot. Notice what happened in Genesis 19, verses 10 and 11. But the men, in this case the angels, put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they weary themselves to find the door. Now here again, we see the same terminology used. God's people were saved by being pulled inside of something. In the other example of Noah, they were put in the ark and God shut the door. So you see also angels in this case shutting the door to protect Lot and his family. The door was then shut and judgment fell on those left outside. As the story progresses, we see that Lot and his family were not raptured out before God rained down judgment on the entire cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. No, they were escorted to a place of safety. We see in Genesis 19, verses 15 through 25. At dawn, the next morning, the angels became insistent. Hurry, they said to Lot. Take your wife and your two daughters who are here. Get out right now, or you will be swept away in the destruction of the city. That's very reminiscent of come out of her, my people, in Revelation. Come out of her, my people, that you do not partake of her plagues. There's a coming judgment on Babylon. Come out of Babylon. You want to know I'm passionate? That's why. I can't stress it enough. And, and you see an example. Get out right now, or you'll be swept away in the destruction of the city. That's what the angels told Lot and his family. When Lot still hesitated, the angel seized his hand and the hand of his wife and two daughters and rushed them to safety outside the city, for the Lord was merciful. When they were safely out of the city, one of the angels ordered, Run for your lives and don't look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains or you will be swept away. Oh no, my lord, Lot begged. I like Christmas. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no. You have been so gracious to me and saved my life, and you have shown such great kindness, but I cannot go to the mountains. Disaster would catch up to me there, and I would soon die. 
See, there's a small village nearby. Please, let me go there instead. Don't you see how small it is? Then my life will be saved. All right, the angel said. I'll grant your request. I will not destroy the little village, but hurry, escape to it, for I can do nothing until you arrive there. This explains why that village was known as Zoar, which means the little place. Lot reached the village just as the sun was rising over the horizon. Then the Lord rained down fire and burning sulfur from the sky on Sodom and Gomorrah. He utterly destroyed them along with the other cities and villages of the plain, wiping out all the people and every bit of vegetation. I believe there are many other scriptures that support the idea of people going into a place of safety during a time of trial, tribulation, judgment, and wrath. Here are just a few examples to illustrate this principle. Exodus 12:13. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Again, think of these in last day's terms, okay? Same same principle, I believe, is applying here. For in the time of trouble, this is Psalm 27, 5, for in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. Psalm 37, 39, and 40. The Lord rescues the godly. He is their fortress in times of trouble. The Lord helps them, rescuing them from the wicked. He saves them, and they find shelter in him. Psalm 83, 3. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. Isaiah 26, 20. Go, my people, enter your rooms and shut the doors behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while until his wrath has passed by. Zephaniah 2, 3. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Prophetically speaking, the day of the Lord is a reference, of course, to the last days all throughout the Bible. Therefore, the seeking the Lord and seeking righteousness part sounds like a reference to people who are prepared and who will be hid just like Noah and his family were in a place of safety during that time. Note also what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 91, verses 1 through 10. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right side, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling ways dwelling place, sorry. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. Psalm 91, verses 1 through 10. I actually had a dream a while back um, that, and it was, I hesitate to call it a dream because it was so vivid. I mean, it was more like a an open vision kind of thing, you know. And uh, in this dream, vision, whatever you want to call it, I was uh, seated at a table, a really long table with friends and family and there's a very bright figure at the end of the table that I can only imagine was Yeshua and it was like all kinds of fresh fruits and vegetables and this amazing banquet was right in front of us and we're all eating but we were inside like a glass dome and outside that glass dome was absolute horrific carnage taking place in every direction you look just horrible carnage in every direction and and the last thing I remember is because it was so startling, it awakened me. But just as I was coming out of it, I heard the, the scripture, I shall prepare a table for you in the midst of your enemies. And uh, that was all in the very beginning when I was coming to the realization, wow, you know, there's probably not a preacher of rapture. Oh, man, that's scary. <laughs> well, if, if we're going through this thing, that's pretty horrific. You know, that's that's terrifying. And it was at that time when I was, coming to that realization that I had that vision, that I had that dream, and it was directed to Psalm 91, which I would encourage you to go uh, read it. I'll, I'll post an audio version. I was going to see if I could play it for you here, but uh, I don't have it um, uploaded. So, uh, But the, the guy who does the voice of the movies, you know, coming this fall, you know, the, the movie previews guy, uh, he's a friend of mine, 
he lives here in Farmer's Branch, uh, Texas, and um, I had it, uh, uh, contracted with him to do uh, some voiceover for me, a project I did a few years ago. And while I had him, I said, hey, John, uh, would you do me a favor? He goes, yeah, sure. I said, would you read Psalm 91 for me? And uh, he did. He's got that really cool voice, and he read Psalm 91 for me, and I, I put it to uh, music. And uh, it's, it's very uh, comforting. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare of the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I am trusting Him. For He will rescue you from every trap and protect you from the fatal plague. He will shield you with His wings. He will shelter you with His feathers. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor fear the dangers of the day nor dread the plague that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, though ten thousand are dying around you, these evils will not touch you, but you will see it with your eyes. You will see how the wicked are punished. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your dwelling. For He orders His angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you with their hands to keep you from striking your foot on a stone. You will trample down lions and poisonous snakes. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. I will satisfy them with a long life and give them my salvation. So uh, I'm not telling you these things to make you afraid. I'm trying to encourage you that if we get on God's page, if we are rehearsing his appointed times and are at the right place at the right time to hear the call to go here or go there or whatever our marching instructions are going to be, then I believe that there is a Goshen waiting for us. There is a Goshen-like environment for us. I believe that that's the parable of the ten virgins. I believe the five wise virgins. Do a keyword search on wise in the commandments, and you'll see that they are inter intimately connected, that wisdom is associated with obeying God and being obedience to the command, uh, in obedience to the commandments, uh, whereas disobedience to the commandments is very often referred to as foolish. <laughs> um, and so... Uh, I came to believe that the, the ten virgins, first of all, they're pure. You know, a virgin's pure. They're waiting for the bridegroom. Well, there's only one people group on the entire planet that fits those two descriptions, pure and waiting for the bridegroom. That's believers. Only believers are pure because we are made righteous through the blood of Christ, uh, through Yeshua. You know, He is our righteousness. So you know, we're pure through His blood. Though my sins be as scarlet, they're made white as snow, Isaiah 118. Um... And we're the only ones who care about the bridegroom coming back. So I believe all ten uh, in the parable are believers. So I was wondering, what's the deal with the five that are wise that go in? They don't go up. They go in, and he shuts the door. And what's the deal with the foolish? Well, I believe that the tribulation martyrs that we see uh, are the believers that didn't get the memo because they weren't at the right place at the right time. They weren't practicing, they weren't rehearsing, they were totally clu clueless to the appointed times, they were celebrating his birthday on Nimrod's day, uh, when Nimrod the Antichrist shows up, he says, hey, thanks for uh, wishing me a happy birthday in somebody else's name, uh, you know, December 25th has everything to do with him and nothing to do with Jesus Christ, so 
if everybody's celebrating his birthday on Nimrod's day, well, they're, they, they're in Babylon, and they're going to get what to do them, probably. Um, I believe that that's your five foolish virgins that will actually go through martyrdom. Uh, they will experience hell on earth. Um, and we, you know, all of us may experience uh, tribulation to some degree, but I, I think that uh, they're the ones that are going to experience more of it, let's say. You know, like I said, the, the Egyptians, I mean, the Israelites experienced three of the ten plagues. So the, the wise may experience some of it as well. But then I think for the hardcore stuff, they are escorted in to an earthbound place of safety at Goshen. Uh, now, again, question everything I say, okay? Don't believe a thing I say. Search this out for yourself. I'm searching myself. This is just the conclusions that I've come to based on my own study of scriptures. I could be wrong, um, but that's that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> that's what I'm thinking so far. So that's why I, we created this ministry in the first place, is because I am so convinced in my own mind that this is true, that I wanted to facilitate a way for people to get on the same page, to, to study these scriptures, to compare these scriptures, to look at it and see them for themselves, and see if maybe they come to the same conclusions as well. Uh, but one way or another, Malachi tells us that we are to remember the law of Moses in a last day's context as well as remembering the name of God. Uh, because Elijah is coming. He says, therefore, I'm sending Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day. Well, why is Elijah coming in the first place? Consider why he came the first time. He came to draw a line in the sand and tell the Israelites, hey, uh, you know all this Baal worship that you've mixed in with the true worship of, of Yahuwah? You can't have that. God's against hybrids of all kinds. You know, be it plant hybrids or animal-human hybrids or whatever. He's against hybrids, okay? He's against the mixing uh, of the holy with the profane, okay? So, he, and he doesn't like having his name slapped on the profane and people saying, yeah, you know, that's what it means to me, like they did with the golden calf that we'll get to later in Exodus chapter 32, which is a perfect example of what Christians are doing with Christmas. I'm not judging you, okay? People think, hey, stop judging me, I'm not judging you. I'm just looking at what the scriptures say and pointing it out to you, and, and I'm, it's a rebuke. And, you know, sadly, rebuke to the one being rebuked feels like condemnation, but that's not what my my heart is. My heart is not to condemn anybody. Uh, con condemnation is a pretty harsh word, and it doesn't fit my heart or my reasons for doing this. I'm 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 trying to stand in the gap and rebuke my brothers and sisters because they're going down the wrong path. If I was going down a wrong path, if I was to get into some kind of immoral uh, or adulterous relationship with somebody else or uh, into drugs or into some sort of sin, I would hope that you would rebuke me. If, in fact, if you were to call me friend, that would be your responsibility to rebuke me, Rob, you, you don't be doing that, man. You're heading down the wrong path. It's going to hurt you. It's going to hurt your relationship. It's going to, you know, it, this is the wrong path for you. I would expect hope and pray that if I ever found myself going astray, that you would rebuke me and and lovingly try to correct me, get me back on the right path again. Just as that is my heart, that's the reason why I'm doing everything I'm doing. It's the reason why I post everything on Facebook that I post. Sometimes that can be harsh. I know. I'm sorry. But uh, there's an urgency here, in my opinion, a terrible urgency. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to be a watchman on the wall. You know, I want my, my hands to be clean. You know, if, if the watchman does not declare what he sees coming and the people perish, then it's on the watchman. It's the watchman's fault. But if the watchman sees something coming and he warns the people about it, well, if they believe him, great. They get, they're get, they saved, you know. If they don't believe the watchman who's saying, hey, bad guy's coming, hey, Antichrist coming, hey, beast system in place, hey, great deception, and you don't listen, well, it's not on the watchman. It's on the people. So, I mean, that's my attitude. I, I don't want any blood on my hands. <laughs> Uh, you know, if, if, and I pray constantly, I'm going to pray right now, Father, you who, God, I just, I read these scriptures and I just get overwhelmed with this sense of urgency. Um, and I know it's not my responsibility, Father, but I, I believe to much, whom much is given, you know, much is required. I believe you've given me an understanding of scripture that I think is correct. And if it is correct, 
and I know that I'm responsible for sharing it. And so I'm doing it the best of my ability. And Father, if I'm wrong, I don't I don't want to. It's not about who's right and who's wrong. Uh, you know, in, in in terms of ego, you know, I I want to be right in your eyes, Father, and and do right. I, I want to do right more than I want to be right. So, Father, if I'm wrong, I pray that you correct me. If I'm right, I pray that people will listen. I pray that you give us a bigger platform to speak uh, so that more can hear. Uh, If we are off on some things, Father, I pray that you will guide us on the right path, that we don't lead anybody astray. Father, bring us all into perfect alignment. Be the director in this divine drama uh, called life and, and show us if we've got our lines wrong. Help us to say them right. If we're not on the mark, help us to get on the mark. Father, I pray that you raise up more people. Uh, give great revelation to these people. Anybody listening to this broadcast, will, if, if their eyes have not been opened yet, that you will remove their, the scales from their eyes that they will see. If I have scales, I ask that you remove the scales from my eyes that I may see so that I'm not the blind leading the blind. Uh, you know, as Jeremiah says, you know, uh, we just need to ask and you'll show us secrets, you know, uh, that have not yet been known. And you say that the scriptures, you know, it's the glory of, uh, uh, of, of God to hide a thing and the glory of kings to search it out. And Father, I pray that you just uh, enable us to find the things that you've hidden, not from us, but for us, as we diligently seek you. Um, Seek and you shall find. That's what your word says. So, Father, we're seeking right now. We're asking right now. Ask and it shall be given to you. Uh, Father, I'm standing on those scriptures. I'm claiming those scriptures. I'm I'm asking you for greater revelation. I'm I'm seeking greater understanding of your ways in these last days. Father, I just pray for everyone listening to this broadcast, whether live or, or in the archives, that they will seek you with all their heart that they will dive into your scriptures, that they will get great revelation as they search the scriptures to see if, whether these things be true, that they start with Moses and the prophets in order to find Yeshua, that they will see your son in all of the Moedim uh, and all the things that the prophets had to say. You, your word says in Amos chapter 3, verse 7, that you you will do nothing, your secret first, to, to, to your servants, the prophets. So the prophets have already been given the secrets. They know, and they wrote it down for us. There's no, there's nothing that we should be in question about regarding the last days. If we want to understand what's going on in the last days, you've already provided it all there for us. God, help us to find it. Help us to dump uh, bad teaching, false peace teaching, whether it was done uh, intentionally or not. I mean, I don't. I, I think a lot of people that I've sat under, love you, Father. I know that they have a heart for you to serve you and to know you, and uh, they've committed their lives to, to serving you. Um, but they don't even know who they are. They, they, they don't know that they've been grafted into the cultivated olive tree that is Israel. They don't know that they've been uh, adopted into that family. They don't know that the new Jerusalem, the bride of Christ, is Israel. They, they're stuck in this whole idea that there's two different groups, and you've written stuff for them, and you've written stuff for us. Uh, but your, your word tells us that there's one law for your chosen people and the aliens among them. There's only one law for everybody. God, just please, I, I just, I don't even know what to say except I, I just grieve for friends and family and colleagues and ministry that are still stuck in Babylon uh, and don't even know it or, or stubbornly holding on to it. Um, Father, I pray that you just show them that they need to let go. Me too, Father, and whatever I'm still holding on to, I pray that you show me that what I need to let go of, uh, that we are not going to partake of the plagues that are coming. God, whatever the instructions you have in your word for us regarding a Goshen, uh, if, if this interpretation is correct, that there there may be an, a Goshen for us in the last days, then show us the roadmap, Father, and make it as clear as possible. Whether we should stay here in this country or whether we should go, um, 
And if we should go, I pray that you reveal it to us in no uncertain terms, that we can't misunderstand that you are clearly showing us where to go and when to go uh, and what to do in the meantime. Uh, I just ask these things in Yeshua's name. Amen.